Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have chatted with a few people. If you suddenly discover that this is interesting, I think there's, I think I'm free at the end of the afternoon if you want to come bug me about things. Um, I've already found the first mistake in this talk. Um, hopefully that will be the last one. So I'm going to start by telling you, just telling you a little bit of a biological story about West Nile virus, which is a, a vector-borne disease of birds, which also spills over into mammals and particularly humans occasionally. And this is all work, well, I'm going to tell you basically two stories. One is about a, an ecological competition question. It's about, we have observed a displacement of one viral strain by another and trying to figure out why that happened. And then the next section is trying to extrapolate and understand how can we predict spread of disease in a highly specious community. So we have, in this, it's, we're going to look at the state of the US state of Texas, where there are 700 bird species, which are all potentially susceptible to West Nile virus. And is there any way that we can actually figure out what's going on with that disease transmission system? And then if I talk really fast, I will spend the last few minutes with some arm wavy philosophical thoughts about where we are in terms of synthesizing all the different kinds of cool data streams that we've got now and trying to make sense of potentially complicated ecological systems. Uh, my, my PhD supervisor used to start a lot of his talks with a joke which is when I say I, I mean we, and when I say we, I mean he did it. <laughs> um, this is my finishing PhD student, Morgan Cain, and this work is basically two chapters of his PhD thesis. So West Nile virus, it's of most concern in North America. It's terrestrial, but at least it's ecological. So. I'm hoping it's still broadly interesting. It's a flavovirus, so it's got a lot of close relatives of much greater public health concern. It's primarily spread, spread by Culex mosquitoes, and it infects hundreds of bird species. As for, to a first approximation, it, affects, it can infect and can be transmitted by all bird species. And just to remind you of the life cycle of a vector-borne disease, if we start with an, a, a bird with an infected, uh, a, a bird that's infected with West Nile, and this is an American robin who will feature a little bit in what follows, it's bitten by an uninfected or in epidemiological jargon, a susceptible mosquito, which picks up the virus. The virus get, makes its way from the mosquito gut to the mosquito salivary glands, at which point the mosquito becomes infectious. It can go bite an uninfected bird and transmit virus to it, and then the cycle continues. And we're going to be interested in trying to synthesize data that we have on all of these steps. How much virus does the bird have in its bloodstream? How long does the bird survive when it's infected? How long does the infection persist in the bird? What's the probability that a mosquito that bites an infected bird gets infected? How long does it take it to become infectious? Does it survive that long? And finally, what's the chances that it bites a, another bird and successfully transmits the infection? So if we want to look at the, if we want to understand disease spread, we need to try to follow the whole life cycle. A little bit more natural history uh, West Nile, this virus is all over the world. The lineage that's in Australia is quite mild in mammals, so it's not of particular, particular public health concern. Lineage 1A is around most of the world and didn't make it to North America until quite recently. Jumped, emerged in North America in 1999 um, from Israel and I'll we'll show you a little bit of evidence there. It, it's quite closely related to strains that were circulating in Israel in the late 90s. It spread across North America in the next four, four years or so, 
And in the course of that time, this is the part of the first story I want to tell you, the original strain that was detected was essentially completely displaced by a novel variant. This is a little piece of the phylogeny of West Nile virus. So if we look at this clade, which includes all of the strains that people collected in New York in 1999 and 2000 in Maryland and New Jersey from horses and birds and humans, it's mixed in with the samples from Israel from the late 1990s. So if we, we know, as much as we know anything in biology, that the virus that's circulating in North America came from, was imported from strains that were circulating in Israel. But the other thing we know is that it does have an ecological impact. This is counts from the North American Breeding Bird Survey of the average number of American crows detected on a sample transect. And they were gradually increasing in the 80s and 90s. Uh, West Nile came in, and they started to decline. You should always be a little bit suspicious when somebody shows you a graph with increases and declines and then points to a particular place on the graph and draws a line. <laughs> but this is when there, there's lots of supporting evidence. Here. This is when West Nile invaded. We know that crows are particularly sensitive, that the, the way that the virus was initially detected is that people started finding lots of dead crows. Uh, furthermore, this is part of a paper that looks across the whole breeding bird survey database and shows that declines in lots of other sensitive species started at the same time. So this is not, this is not completely cherry-picked. Um, if you're not a bird biologist, you might care more about what's happening in mammals. They're not, they're not interesting in terms of disease dynamics because they're dead-end hosts. But humans get infected, horses, cats, dogs, squirrels. I don't know what, I, you know, this is partly a list of which mammals have people actually looked for West Nile virus in. But they all seem to be dead end hosts. So the transmission is happening in the bird community. And occasionally, a mosquito that has bitten an infected bird decides that its next blood meal is going to be from a human, and then the human gets infected. If you do a serological survey, you see which people have um, antibodies to West Nile in their blood. You can figure out that only about 20% of the people who get infected with West Nile ever have any symptoms that they report. Um, this is from the US Centers for Disease Control. This is on a long scale. The black lines are cases. There's two ways that you, you can get West Nile. You can get a sort of generalized flu-like illness with fever, or if you're very unlucky, the virus can make it into your central nervous system and you have neuroinvasive. And if you look at the number of deaths, the number of deaths from the fever version are you know, not more than about 10 per year in all of the US. Um, but there's actually quite, there's, there's on the order of 100 deaths from, the, from people where the virus gets into their central nervous system. None of this, or very little of this, is particularly relevant to the ecological stories that I'm about to tell you, but somehow humans are interested in what's going on in humans. And I guess in the, in the wider frame of things, if this weren't happening, there's another, you know, 500 viruses that are circulating in ecological communities all the time that we never notice and don't care about. The reason that we're studying this case study, the reason that we have data to synthesize, is that we do care something about this virus because it occasionally gets into humans. We don't know much about what's actually happening with the incidence of West Nile virus in birds because people don't go out and draw blood from birds and sample it for West Nile and sample for antibodies for West Nile. What we do have is a very crude proxy, which is the human incidence. So this is West Nile cases per 2,000 people. In 2001, there were cases in the Northeast and the Southeast. In 2002, it's 
increased very rapidly and spread west. By 2003, it had basically gotten to all of North America. The other thing is that these, this is the proportion of cases that are due, the proportion of viral strains collected that are New York 99 or West or WNO2. I'm going to keep saying West Nile when I mean WNO2, just because that's what the WN stands for. And you can see that there's a very rapid displacement. So the question is, well, why? What's WNO2 doing? What's so special about this new strain that it's able to outcompete the old strain so effectively? If you look at the speed of the ecological transition, you can estimate that there's a fitness difference of about three, apparently, based on this landscape level replacement, of about threefold. I need to spend a minute or two telling you or reminding you what R0 means. This is the number that all epidemiologists want to know about a new pathogen, which is how many new cases will a single infected individual create over its entire infectious period in an otherwise susceptible population? So if I get, if I'm patient zero for some horrible new disease and I come in here and I breathe and spread my microbes around, how many of you will I have infected by the time I recover or die? Um, in the case of a vector-borne disease, you're looking across the whole life cycle. So you're saying, if I start with one infected bird, that bird infects a bunch of mosquitoes. Those mosquitoes go on to infect a bunch of, infect of birds. And I want to know, essentially, how many birds does each bird infect? There's a lot of stories told with fairly high confidence in the literature that I want to come back and be skeptical about, <laughs> which is when people are looking at West Nile, they said there's a fairly influential paper that said, well, the important biological difference between WNO2 and New York 99 is that WNO2 makes it from the mosquito gut to the mosquito salivary gland much more quickly. There's an increased incubation rate in mosquitoes. Another story, I'm not, I know Martin Kilpatrick, he's a nice guy, and I'm not picking on him personally. Another story is that American robins are really important. They're kind of a keystone or a critical species for the transmission of West Nile virus. And another story, which turns out to be better supported than those, is that there seems to be a little bit of a dilution effect going on, meaning that bird communities with more diversity actually lead to less human, fewer human cases, which is an interesting story from a conservation perspective, because it means you can go to your legislator and say, hey, here's a reason that we ought to preserve bird diversity. And I sound a little skeptical, and I am a little skeptical, but we'll, we'll talk about that more. Coming back and just reminding you, we, Morgan and I, so this is the we means, he means, whatever, decided we would try to figure this out. And we would basically, Morgan went and looked in the literature for all of the lab studies that studied bird to mosquito transmission, all of the lab studies that studied mosquito incubation. Essentially, there's, there's a lot of information about the various pieces of these life cycle, this life cycle. And the question is, what can I get if I can gather and synthesize all the data about all those pieces? If you want to calculate R0 from bird species I to bird species J at a given temperature for a given strain of virus, you need to add up on a given day of its infection, what's the probability that a bird is still alive and still transmitting? What's the probability, what are the, how many mosquito bites, how many mosquitoes bite it? What's its probability of transmission to the mosquito for each of those bites? And then for each of those days, each of those infected mosquitoes has a whole infectious period. And on each of those days, it has to survive and bite a bird and successfully transmit to the bird. And then we have to take account of the number of mosquitoes per bird, the proportion of each species in the community, and the biting preference for for the mosquitoes on each of those species. So 
lots of work in literature, and then what Morgan did is fit a model for the effect of temperature, the effect of day of infection, the effect of bird species, who did the study, uh, which genotype it was, and for some of the mosquito effects, we also want to know what the environmental temperature was. In the case of birds, birds are homeotherms, doesn't really matter if the temperature varies a few degrees. What matters to viral physiology is the temperature of the bird, but that's obviously not true for mosquitoes. We did this all in a fairly fancy new Bayesian fitting framework that some of you are already using and I'd be happy to talk about. So, results. Results part one. We, Morgan found four species for which there was, there had been enough experiments on both strains of the virus. We're trying to look at a comparison between NY99 and WNO2. So we need experiments, either experiments that do both strains or multiple experiments that do each strain. And there are four species that either because they're especially sensitive to West Nile virus or because we think they're particularly good reservoirs or because they're very common birds and nobody cares too much if you experimentally infect a few dozen of them with West Nile. <laughs> these, are, these are the species that are most commonly studied. There are another 10 or 20 species in which both strains have been studied, but there's basically kind of one experiment per species. So we're gonna focus on these four for a while. We fitted, this is bird survival, so we fitted a logistic curve with a complementary log, log, blah, 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 to get a survival curve. And you can see that American crows die. A lot of them die, they die pretty quickly. American robins survive quite well. The confidence intervals are very wide. You can see that New York 99 kills birds quite a bit, kills crows quite a bit faster than WNO2 but the confidence intervals are wide and overlap a lot. So this is what we think the difference is, but the difference could go in the other direction based on the data we have. If we look at the tighter, the virus concentration in the bloodstream of an American crow that was infected on day zero and how much, if it was still alive, how much Virus did have its in its blood after seven or eight days. Again, so in this case, we're fitting a, a Gaussian-shaped curve. Uh, again, they're even more similar between strains in these cases, and the confidence intervals are a little narrower because it's a lot easier to measure tighter than to measure the number of birds surviving or or dying. But so there's even less support for differences between for important fitness differences between these two viruses here. If we go ahead and look at the probability that a mosquito, in this case it's actually usually not birds they're biting, but bags of infected chicken blood that they're biting. All these fun little details that you get to learn when you study disease. So the probability of transmission as a function of titer is very, is very similar indeed across these two genotypes. And finally, the mosquito to bird transmission, there's three pieces going on here. There's the difference between the strains, which are very small. So that's the difference between the dashed and the solid line here. We're looking at two different temperatures, or we've, we've plotted, there's a continuous function of temperature in the model, but we're plotting it at 21 and 26 C. And then we're looking at the transmission as a function of day and this is essentially the incubation period and is a function of the titer that that mosquito was initially infected with. So we can, now we have, we, we have all the information we need to go all the way around the life cycle. So we, in fact, if we go back to this, except for this ecological stuff that I'm not gonna talk about right now, we have all of these different pieces. We have the bird survival, the mosquito survival, the transmission, and so forth. So, and we're doing this in a Bayesian framework so we can take all the uncertainty and put it into a distribution of an estimated R-naught. 
Right now, these are R0s done separately for each species. So these are, these are essentially monoculture r -naughts. If we had a big colony of American crows, and every mosquito that bit a crow went and bit a crow after that. This is how many crows does each crow infect? How many sparrows does each sparrow infect? r naught equal 1 here is a disease that's just barely viable. r naught equals 1 is a disease that's maintaining itself but not spreading at all. So really, these lower tails are, are ecologically unrealistic because they would imply a strain of West Nile virus that couldn't even replace itself, and so we wouldn't be doing the study in the first place. We have these two strains, and we have them at two different temperatures, and the main take-home from this is that there's not a lot of difference between these two strains. So the distribution of r naught for WNO2 at 16 degrees in the American crow is not very different from the estimated distribution of r naught at 16 degrees for New York 99 in the American crow. We can do a little better by combining this, by, by essentially taking all the ratios from that previous graph. So in a given bird species at a given temperature, what's the ratio of the estimated West Nile of WNO2 R0 to the estimated New York 99. Anything believed below one means that New York 99 actually should win in an ecological competition. So in fact, if we put together all the data we have, it suggests that overall it actually looks like New York 99 should be a little bit better. Because slightly more than half of these are below one. Three is the value that Snappen et al. said it looks like we would need, based on the landscape level trajectory, to explain the displacement. And that's certainly still consistent with a lot of the data. <laughs> but if you analyze these data from scratch, you, you wouldn't, the, the, the probability that you would assign to WNO2 being more than three times better than New York 99 would actually be fairly small. It's pretty large in American crows at 16 degrees. On the other hand, there weren't very, American crows declined pretty quickly, so they're, they're, they're strongly affected by the epidemic, but they're not around in the population for very long to spread the epidemic. So, and, and really one of, the, one of the major depressing take-home messages from this talk is that when you actually incorporate all the sources of uncertainty and go all the way around the life cycle, you often end up with concluding that you're very uncertain about what's going on. <laughs> um, one of the things I like to say at this point is that an optimist is really just a poorly informed pessimist. <laughs> um, how about the story about the fact that the reason that WNO2 wins is that it incubates faster? So this is all the data that we have on mosquito incubation at different temperatures with different strains at different numbers of days post-infection. So for any color, we're looking at the contrast between the dashed line and the dotted line. And we can kind of ignore this because these are low temperatures where the virus doesn't, incubate, doesn't spread very well anyway. This yellow line here is, the, is most of the data from that one paper that said, I think the reason that WNO2 is spreading fast is that it incubates faster in mosquitoes. At 32 degrees by about a day. And so another, again, another story, we, we need primary data, we need people to actually study things, you need data, but it's very easy to do a study which is kind of looking through a keyhole and seeing one little piece of what's going on and say, aha, I've discovered what's going on. And when you, when you try to collect and synthesize, you don't get the same kind of certainty that, that this particular piece of the life cycle that I happen to be studying that happens to make a fairly large difference at a particular temperature is the reason that this ecological transition is happening. Finally, to continue in the skeptical vein for one more minute, there's this conclusion that American robins are a, a, an important species in spreading the disease. 
This is the transmission curve, so this is the probability of, of in mosquito infection at a given titer. This is the titer curve for American robins. I'm going to take this and rotate this so that, so that I can look at these axes alongside each other. So this is the same, totally different scale, very distorted, but this is the same scale as on this axis. This is the study, this is the data point from the study that gave rise to the, one part of the, what gave rise to the conclusion that American robins were really competent hosts, that American robins were really good at transmitting. They did an experiment that said, look, they've got this really high titer and that should give rise to a really high probability of transmission through mosquito. But what we conclude based on many, many more studies so the, the, this typical measure of host competence is the expected number of mosquitoes that if, they, if a mosquito bit the bird, a, a bird every day, what's the total number of mosquitoes that would be infected by that bird? So this study said it was 1.08, and the over, our overall conclusion is that it's only probably only 0.6. On the other hand, it is true that if you collect mosquitoes and you filter out the ones that have a recent blood meal, so you look in their gut and you find that they actually have red blood cells and also white blood cells because that's what we're going to need to do the sequence, and you find the ones that are infected and you sequence the DNA from the blood that they've got in their gut to find out what, speed, what bird species they were feeding on most recently. More than 50% of the infected mosquitoes in these two particular studies that were done in Maryland and Chicago were from American robins. So this does, now that doesn't say that the robins are passing the disease on, but it says that there are probably a lot of infected American robins that are getting bitten by mosquitoes. This could all, again, this is a kind of looking through a keyhole. We know that there are lots of infected robins infecting mosquitoes in these, sorry, I lied. These, these mosquitoes are being infected, obviously. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate to what's going on in the whole community. One theme, so maybe there's, maybe there's bird hosts other than these four bird species for which we have lots of data that are the ones that, maybe there's a bird species out there in which West Nile WNO2 has a big advantage, but we just haven't found it yet. Um, something that I'm going to come back to is that the mosquito side of this is still very light. We were, we were disappointed. So we wrote a paper and we got it published and we were happy, but we were disappointed that we don't really know, we didn't really estimate what's going on in the community. We said this is what would happen if we had a whole bunch of crows, this is what would happen if we had a whole bunch of sparrows, this is what would happen if we had a whole bunch of robins. All but four species were lumped into our other category because we didn't have enough data. <coughs> And so we can only make predictions for, for communities that are mostly made up of those four species. So what would we do if we wanted to predict disease transmission in a real bird community? We're gonna need to, we're gonna need to send Morgan back to the library for a long time. We need information on the bird species composition which we're gonna get by getting information about how many birds people saw and what their probability was of seeing them if they were there. We need to know something about mosquito biting preferences. This is all in that ecological section at the bottom of the equation that I told you we were mostly ignoring for a while. And we're gonna need all that information that we had before about those four species, but we're gonna need it on 700 species. This sounds very grim. But this is, this is actually the, the happy ending part of this story, because we figured out ways to do all these things. So, does anybody, have people heard of eBird? A few people have heard of eBird. eBird is a way to harness the obsession of amateur birders. So, 
you get an app on your phone and you walk to work in the morning. When you get to work, you say, on my walk to work, I saw five of these and three of these and seven of these and two of these. So you get a com from each user, from each session, you get a complete checklist of what they did see and by implication also what they didn't see at a given place and time. Um, we decided to focus on Texas because it's got a fair amount of West Nile, it's got a lot of birds, it's got a lot of enthusiastic birders. <laughs> so over the course of seven years, there are about a million and a half complete checklists in the eBird data set. We, I mean Morgan, um, aggregated these to total counts per, of each bird species for each county and month, um, of which there are a total of 34,000, of which, and there are about 700 unique species. With we meaning he had to do a little bit of extra work to make sure we were always getting from the common name to the appropriate species name. That's getting better. There's more and more online resources for doing that. Um, detectability. Go back to the library or go back to Web of Science and PubMed and find 1,500 titles and abstracts that look like they might have something to do with information about bird detectability. Of those 1,500, about 12 actually have useful information about bird detectability, <laughs> which gives us information on about 500 species, 400 of which are from one of those papers, thank God. <laughs> um, and that was itself a big synthesis of data. We also are going to, we're going to do something really slick to get the detectability for the other 200 species. But in order to do that, we also want to correct for body mass. So, you know, ostriches are more detectable than warblers, presumably. <laughs> um, again, amazingly, somebody published the CRC handbook of avian body masses, <laughs> which also has a CD-ROM in the back, so you don't have to type the whole damn thing in yourself. <laughs> this is, most of this is really hard work and thinking about how you put all the pieces together. This is kind of the one sort of clever technical innovation that I think we made, which is we're, we're missing a lot of information. There are a lot of species for which we haven't measured what we want to know. We're going to do phylogenetic imputation. So we're going to say we know a, we don't know anything about this bird species, but we know something about its close relatives. And we, we have a phylogeny, so we know which species are close relatives. And this is not a brand new idea. We developed some new machinery that makes this work pretty quickly for 700 species and allows you to incorporate all those other pieces of body mass and, and other effects. So you can essentially put this in as another term in a regular mixed model that has all the other things you want. So I'm just going to go over the, the, the idea here for a second. So there's a bird species for which we don't know, well, we're going to model the amount of virus in the bloodstream of a given species on a given day. That species has a given body size, and we gave it a particular dose. These are the, the blackbirds, just to zoom in on a little piece of the bird phylogeny. And we were lazy and used the consensus phylogeny. We could, if we wanted to do even more work, average across the uncertainty in the phylogeny. This is zooming in on one particular family. The, the cyan here are the species for which we have some data. We're, I, we're expanding a little bit because we're not now trying to do a cross-strain comparison. So we're, we're, we're taking any bird species for which we have a WNO2 study, which is a slightly, so we might have maybe 100 bird species instead of 30 or 40. We've got data on all of these species, but we're missing data on this, these species. We're going to fit, when we fit the model, what we're getting is an estimate of the evolutionary change that happened over each of the branches of the phylogeny. So what we see for brown-headed cowbirds is the sum of each of these effects plus this little branch 
plus whatever things are due to body size and day and so forth. If we want to estimate what the bronze cowbird looks like, we're going to take this estimate because this is the this or the 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 imputed ancestor here is the information that we have, and this term, this branch that we haven't measured goes into our uncertainty because we know that there's an extra, we're estimating the amount of variability per unit of evolution. So we can, in addition to estimating that our best guess is that this looks like this, we can also estimate that there's an additional component of uncertainty due to essentially its distance from the closest relatives that we've actually measured. And we use that trick throughout to fill in data for species for which we didn't have information. To get biting preferences, we use that blood meal ID technique that I mentioned, where you take a mosquito that's taken a blood meal and see what it's bitten most recently, and compare that to the species composition. So if 25% if of the mosquitoes that you catch have taken their last blood meal from house sparrows, but house sparrows make up 50% of the population, that means that mosquitoes really don't like house sparrows, and conversely. So we're estimating, we're estimating, we're using a prior here based on what the eBird people thought was there, and we're using the data on the observed birds in that particular study to, to fill in our estimate of what the actual bird composition was, and then we're fitting a model of the expected number of birds bitten by that species given the number, sorry, the expected number of mosquitoes with that species blood in it given that composition. So we do all this work, we put all these pieces together. As is often the case, your first conclusion is the one that any biologist would have said, oh, well, yeah, of course. Um, so there's a very strong effect of temperature. Um, and if we look, these are for, uh, for all the communities that we estimated are not for in a given month, this is the distribution. So these are across years and across counties. In December, what was the range of the median R0? And the reason it's the median R0 is that we're still being Bayesian and getting distributions for everything. So this is essentially the distribution of point estimates of R0 for a given, in a given month. So it looks like it's seasonal. It looks like it's basically following the temperature. It doesn't, as I said, we don't actually know what's going on in West Nile virus and birds. The way that people monitor for West Nile virus is actually with sentinel chickens, which is you put a bunch of chickens out in a cage and you wait for them to get bitten by mosquitoes and you sample their blood every so often and see if they've got West Nile virus. The human cases, which is what we do know about, don't match our estimated curve of R0 very well. So either we completely screwed up our model, or more likely, there are a lot of other things going on that aren't in our model at all, like changes in mosquito population density, changes in bird behavior, and lots of changes in human activity. When are humans outside with shorts and short sleeve shirts on. And it would take, would take quite a bit more work to get from where we already are to there. We also, since, since we did all this work to assess the bird communities, we did a little bit of work to try to summarize our estimates in terms of a spatial model. You can estimate this based on Latin long. You can estimate this based on eco-regions. It kind of comes out the same either way. Lots of the spatial covariates are strongly correlated with each other. And there's a fairly, the effect on r once you've already accounted for temperature, is a fairly small range based on the bird, on the bird community. Lots of people are interested in what happens, whether there's, a, whether there's an observed higher level relationship with human population density. And the answer is, unfortunately, it's hard to disentangle that from all the other spatial gradients in the system. The other thing that we can do with this model, and this is, this is generally one of the big benefits of running, a, of building and 
parametrizing a mechanistic model that you think you kind of believe a little bit, which is that you can then do all kinds of experiments with the model that you couldn't possibly do in the real world. So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate species effects by removing the species from the community. If we take a species, so we take a community, an observed community based on eBird and detectability, and we estimate the R0 for that based on all the transmission information. And then we say, well, what if there weren't any mourning doves in that community at, anymore? What if we went out and shot all of the mourning doves? Well, R0 would, our estimated R0 goes up. And this is the range across all communities, well, the 95% range across communities. And that means that mourning doves are actually diluters. When you take them out of the system, our West Nile virus transmits better than when they were there. Um, American robins, as foreshadowed, actually look, our, our definition of a diluter species was one where the 95% confidence intervals of the 95% range of communities didn't include one. But American robins are, according to this definition, almost a diluter species or, almost, or usually Usually, taking robins out of a community actually increases the transmission of West Nile virus. And then we have some, and there's a whole, there's, I didn't bother to show you all 700 species because that would be boring. This is just the upper tail and the lower tail of that whole distribution. So there are birds that would lower R0 by 5 or 10% if you took them out of the community. Um, and at the, pop, at the community level, so these are the observed species richnesses in the communities, you know, again, based on what people saw in the communities at three different temperatures. And the, what the dilution effect says is that more <laughs> species rich communities should transmit disease less well. And there's a bunch of arguments whether this is because as you get higher species richness, you're biased towards poor, poorly competent hosts, or whether it's a straight diversity and mosquitoes biting two different species are likely to interrupt the transmission. But it does look like there's some mild evidence for a protective effect, and you should take that very non-seriously because this is correlational, um, in our predicted R0 as a, on the basis of bird community. So of those kind of pieces of wisdom that I told you about at the beginning, this is the one that actually seems to hold up. I'll tell you what's wrong with our model before you tell me what's wrong with our model, although you can probably tell me a bunch more things. We got given a very hard time and quite reasonably by reviewers of this paper for not having nearly enough mosquito ecology. And we agree. This is, this is a kind of a typical, well, all other things being equal, this is what the bird community would do to the transmission of West Nile virus. Mosquito densities change, mosquito compositions change, mosquito behavior changes. We've looked everywhere we can for mosquito sampling data, but there's not an e-mosquito. Right? You don't have an app <laughs> where you type in, I saw three Culex pipkins on the way to work today. Um, things are getting a little bit better. There is a bunch of mosquito sampling going on, and people are getting better at collecting that into databases in a common format that data parasites like me and my students can go use later on. Um, the other thing that's more technical that I won't go into much detail on is that there are some su surprising effects of variabilities. Some of these will be surprising to some of you, and some of them won't be surprising, depending on how much you've done this sort of thing. When you increase the variability, you can also change the mean of your prediction. And so there's a lot of places in here where we, if we, if we propagated uncertainty from a particular part of the model, we'd end up with a very different answer than if we didn't propagate the uncertainty. And there's a few pieces in here that I still don't entirely understand where we, where we would 
put in a new source of variability and the variability in, in the outcomes would actually decrease. We tried to do something, we tried to create a summary figure that was fraction of the overall variance due to this component of uncertainty and this component of uncertainty and this component of uncertainty. And that turned out to be harder and more confusing than we thought it was going to be. So I have talked fast enough that I will allow myself to philosophize for two or three minutes. Um, it is important, I'm going to claim, even though it's depressing, it's very common for people to take a complicated, a complicated ecological system and fit a model to one piece and take the answers from that piece and put it into the next piece down the chain, and, but they're only putting the point estimates from that big complicated model in. So at each stage, they're kind of un underestimating the uncertainty that's going through. And I am, I am absolutely uh, opportunistic about whether I'm going to be using Bayesian methods or frequentist methods, but Bayesian methods do make it easier to, to keep all of the uncertainty going through the whole way. Um, as I said, trying to account for the full life cycle and not do an experiment on the part that you're interested in and claim that that is all other things being equal, this would have a big effect. And the other thing that, that comes up in this work and comes up in other work that I'm doing is it's very common when you're dealing with a big ecological system to say, well, there's 27 parameters here and these are the 17 that we're really interested in. And for the other 10, we'll take values from the literature. And usually when you take values from the literature, you're taking a number from the literature. And that may be okay if you're just trying to understand the qualitative behavior. Like maybe that variation doesn't affect the qualitative behavior very much, but it tends to have, it tends to overstate the certainty that you have about what's going on. Um, the more different sources of information you can get, so I would say our phylogenetic imputation is one way, one way that we've tried to be clever. The more information you can get from different sources, every little bit of extra information that you can get and integrate into your model has the potential to narrow those confidence intervals a little bit. And something that I'm interested in working on in the future is combining information from different scales. This was a very much a bottom-up approach. We took all the information from the lab experiments and all the information from eBird and so forth and moved it all forward into a prediction of R0. But we didn't take the human cases or the horse cases and incorporate that information that we had at the landscape level. I didn't incorporate the fact that I didn't incorporate the fact that we know that the R0 can't really be less than one. So we didn't, there's a lot of higher level information that we could possibly include in the models to constrain things more. So that when you get an answer that's ridiculous at the landscape level, you are trimming that in an appropriate way. Finally, just thinking about, so I, this was originally a text list and then I decided to make some pictures of some citizen scientists and some remote, this is an Argos tag on a hawksbill turtle and this is the standard, everybody uses it, picture of remote sensing, just a satellite doing something in space. Um, and this is Illumina's line of, of uh, genome sequencers. And we do have, if we can use it all, we do have more and more big data streams coming online that we can try that we can try to incorporate. This is a picture I put together a while ago for a meeting where we were supposed to wave our arms about the future of mathematical biology. These are sequencing costs per megabase of DNA. This is a log scale. So this was sequencing costs declining exponentially. This was next generation sequencing. And then sequencing costs have continued to decline exponentially at about the same rate that they were before. I don't have the last few years of data, but I think it's probably just continued in this direction. These dashed lines are the approximate slope that people have estimated for the speed at which computing power is improving. It was actually originally 
derived from the data on the number of transistors you could fit on a single chip. But so this says that except for next-gen sequencing, if it's just a matter of raw processing power keeping up with raw sequencing power, we're actually more or less okay. Once, once we can, if we can ingest this, then, and we can, we can keep on this trajectory. But this just makes me think a little bit more, and again, this is, this is what I call a beer question and not a coffee question, about what are our limitations in trying to figure out what complicated ecological systems are doing? Well, we, we never think we have enough data. We don't have data about the right kinds of things. If we get all the data we want, we have to be able to stick it into a computer. Computing is getting cheap, always getting cheaper and more convenient. If you can improve the algorithm you're using, you might be able to do the same problem 10 or 100 times faster on the same computer. But you've also got to be able to keep track of all the code you wrote to do all those things and that there's not a bug somewhere and that the version you're using today is the same as the version you used yesterday. So I, I still think we're kind of in the artisanal modeling world where we're, where we're putting together each of the models and, and getting each of, you know, attending to each little detail. It took, you know, it took more than a year or two to do these things. And I don't know whether that's a reasonable amount of time or whether we're going to need to train 300 times more modelers to get done what needs doing. I will stop there. I'm happy to answer questions.